Eighth Meeting, Monday, June 17th, 1974. Adzan Mahabua gave the following talk. When the jitta is calm, it also wants to sleep, which is strange. In other words, when the jitta is calm, it is contented, and when it is not calm, it is not contented. When thinking far and wide, it is not contented and does not want to sleep, but as soon as the jitta begins to get calmer and calmer, it wants to sleep, which means that it gets increased happiness. A short while ago, I was sitting developing calm and also felt that I would like to sleep, but I did not let it go as far as sleep, because sleep puts not only the jitta but also the body into a state of rest. While listening to a tamma talk, a desna, you become absorbed in listening to the tamma. The jitta is attending to the sound of the tamma talk, which is its only object of attention. The jitta gradually becomes more and more calm, causing it to become drowsy and go into a dreamy doze. Some people blame themselves, saying, How is this? When I am alone or talking with my friends, I don't feel sleepy. So why is it that when I listen to a tamma talk I want to sleep, and I sit nodding out of control? From where does this Mara come? What is this about Mara? The jitta has never experienced happiness and contentment, but as soon as it receives the flow of tamma, lulling it into happiness, calm, and contentment, it just wants to go to sleep. From where does this Mara come? In truth, the owner of this jitta is the Mara that disturbs the jitta all day and night without allowing any peace and contentment to arise, until the jitta cannot sleep because it is not calm. But we don't understand the reason for this. As soon as we listen to the teacher giving a tamma talk, the jitta grows calm and thus wants to sleep. We then say that it is Mara. Truly it is not Mara, for we all tend to feel sleepy as soon as we become contented. This means that the result of the stage where the jitta is sufficiently contented is a tendency to want to sleep. This happens at the first stage of training. If the jitta has a foundation of calm, then it has work to do while listening to a tamma talk. The nature of that work will depend on the foundation or basic level of the jitta. Then we will not be drowsy. If we have been doing samadhi, then we will be engrossed in samadhi. When we are at the level of wisdom, we will become engrossed in contemplation while the teacher is giving the tamma talk. Our hearts will tend to follow and become enraptured by the object of attention of tamma. It is as though the teacher helps to clear the way so that one can follow in his footsteps, step by step. This indicates that one has got to the stage of vipassana, which means contemplation, and the jitta is engrossed in following the object of contemplation, so there's no drowsiness. This shows how drowsiness occurs when one begins to do meditation practice. In other words, the jitta does not normally want to drop into a state of calm, but as soon as it begins to feel calm, the calm makes it want to lie down and sleep, because calm is contentment. In evaluating or proving a religion, and most especially Buddhism, which is the teaching of the Buddha, the evaluation should be done with one's own heart. In what way did the Lord teach? Take up the Lord's method and practice it, or take up the method which the Lord taught and put it into the practice for the sake of your own heart. In other words, practice to develop your heart. If your heart follows the way that the Lord taught, what sorts of results will you get? You will gradually come to know the truth for yourself. Then the proof of the Buddha's teaching on Tamma will appear in your own heart, showing you which things are good and true and which are false. You will come to know this gradually by taking the principles of the teaching as a means of pointing out the truth and falsehood which is in your own heart, for they are not to be found anywhere else except in your own heart. Generally we do not know that our hearts contain false things, nor do we know from where or from what the falsehood comes. When we do not know this, we think that we are good and clever, more clever than any teaching, more clever than Buddhism, more clever than the Buddha, more clever than any teacher who founded a religion to teach the world. We assume this even though it is an extremely stupid opinion. In fact, it is our extreme stupidity that makes us think we are supremely clever. 
when we have taken up the principles of Buddhism and put them into practice to test and see to what extent they are actually true, then we will be able to know the truth about the principles of Dhamma which the Lord taught. In the beginning, we are not able to do this effectively, so we start by taking it in brief or by taking up a short, easy method, such as the Lord's teaching of Pavana, meditation. How do we focus our attention so that it may be called Pavana? In the principles that are taught in Buddhism, there are various different methods to suit the abilities of those who practice so that they may attain a calm and peaceful heart, which is the result that comes from practice. For example, focusing your attention on your breathing, anabhanasati. In doing this, you should continually feel the breath as it enters and leaves. Don't let your attention slip and wander away, and don't let go of the jitta and send it away to other things. Just develop understanding and knowing of the breath. This is one method of knowing about the truth and falsehood of one's own heart. When your heart becomes calm, you will see the falsehood of your heart, and at the same time you will also see the truth that is in it. In addition, you will see the faults of the restless, distracted wandering of the heart, which causes you to be agitated and unha which causes you to be agitated and unhappy. At the same time, you will also see the merit and virtue of a calm, cool heart, which brings you happiness while the heart is calm. This is called inwardly seeing both the wrong and the right at the same time. One who has determined to practice truly is bound to see in this way, because the principles of, th because the principles of Buddhism guarantee that the causes are correct and accurate, and that the results are satisfying, following the experience of the Lord Buddha. Here is a method you can try out in relation to the citta in order to see results coming steadily from your practice. Try to have mindfulness, sati, and clear self-awareness, sampajanya, to be aware of yourself at all times. This is a way to be careful and watchful of the citta, only letting it know what is within the field that you have established, so that it has a limited boundary to its knowing. Don't allow it to know in a scattered and aimless way without any limit or boundary, which is the way that nearly everybody in the world acts. Knowledge and understanding of this sort is not the type of knowledge and understanding that goes towards that level which gives rise to happiness and contentment, enabling causes and results to be seen. You must therefore have a limited field in doing the practice for the development of the jitta by holding to the principles of Thamma, which are the principles of Buddhism and the right way for the jitta to go. They will guide the citta along those paths which are taught in Buddhism, which is the way that always leads in the right direction. If you use one of the Parigamma words, Buddha, Thammo, or Sankho, to establish mindfulness in the citta, your attention must be kept firmly on that Parigamma word. If the mind slips away to think about all sorts of things, you should try to understand what has happened, and use various techniques, such as rapidly repeating the Parigamma word, to bring your attention back again. Whatever technique or method that enables your heart to gain peace and calm and to arouse various skillful means internally may be considered a right method of training yourself. If the jitta becomes calm, then concerns about time and place do not enter and make contact with the jitta. There is just knowing and dwelling alone. And this is happiness, sulkha. Whether you sit for a long time or not, nothing comes to cause disturbances. Wherever you sit, and for however long, nothing comes into relationship with the jitta as long as the jitta does not go out and get entangled with things, and as long as it has tamma as the object of attention, aramana. This is a state of calm that dwells alone, and there is self-knowing right there at that time. This is called knowing by way of meditation, pawana, or knowing by means of guarding the jitta, or knowing by means of guarding the jitta. There is a boundary to knowing and understanding in this way. This is the initial method for progressing in meditation. However long you go on doing the practice, you should not abandon the method that you have been in the habit of using. Instead, you should hold on to it as a foundation. Thus, for example, if you are using anapanasati, you take the breath as the foundation of your practice. The skill of the jitta that has done the breathing practice constantly for a long time and has attained calm often will know things at a speed which is very different from normal consciousness. In a moment it will pass on to a level of subtlety where the breath disappears and goes utterly quiet, and you will not know where the breath has gone. 
This indicates the level of skillfulness of the jitta. It's like someone who learns to write the word you. To begin with, he must think of the first letter, then the second, and so on until it is finished. But after learning for a while, the letters, the sounds, the vowels and consonants all arise together. Skillfulness of the jitta, whether in samadhi or in wisdom, is similar to this, and the Lord called it tana. The four tanas. First, patama dana. Second, dutiya tana. Third, datiya tana. And fourth, jatutta tana are the rupatanas. Beyond them are the four arupatana, altogether making the eight attainments, samabhati, plus sanya vedayitta nirotha, which is the quelling of sanya, memory, and feeling, vedana, which is the quelling of sanya, memory, and vedana, feeling. But these samabhati are tamas that are special or are connected with the characteristic abilities, nissayavasana, of those who are inclined to go this way, so they will occur spontaneously. But these are not tammas that are necessary to the path, magga, or the fruition, pala, in which there is the getting rid of gilesas and reaching the levels and states of purity of heart leading to arahanship. In any case, the person who is skilled in tana is similar to the person who is skilled in writing, and that is all. Because of the speed of the jitta, that person can immediately reach the first tana, the second tana, and so on. But the characteristics of a jitta that easily changes its state like this means that it does not move up step by step through each successive stage like a person walking upstairs. However able we are at going upstairs, we do not jump several steps at a time, but go up one by one. But the special skill of the jitta inclined to attain tana is such that in one moment it can reach its intended goal with extreme rapidity. Nothing is faster than the jitta, and this type of jitta is the fastest. And the more it becomes skilled in these functions, the faster it becomes. Beyond the imagination of anyone who has not seen the power of the jitta that is used to knowing and seeing various things in the practice of tamma. Samadhi is similar for such a person. Once the heart has become accustomed to being calmed by his own skill, there is no need for him to find a bodhigamma word to fix his attention and force the jitta to remain still so as to make it enter a state of calm. As soon as the jitta's activity is limited by means of mindfulness, it immediately becomes fully calmed. Within just half a second it attains calm and reaches a state of tranquility. Nothing hinders it as it drops to the level of samadhi. This is what is meant by one who has skill in samadhi. As soon as that person fixes his attention for just one moment, the jitta goes entirely through into samadhi, just as one can write the word you and immediately read it without any need to grope and think or search for the vowels and consonants, spending a lot of time as we had to in the beginning. In speaking of the levels of samadhi, when you are skilled it is as described above, but please do not assume that you are skilled, for this is a kind of speculation that can easily deceive you wasting a lot of time and preventing you from seeing the results in the way that you ought to. Whether you are skilled or not, simply train yourself in that method that you normally use. This is an important principle, which also applies when learning how to write. We write a single letter over and over again until we are skilled at doing it. There is no need to anticipate the way to write all the other letters, for in due time skill at them will grow of itself as we go on practicing. The method of training the heart is like this for skill will arise and grow naturally as we train ourselves. Banya is wisdom of the jitta, thinking and mentally putting things together by contemplating using reason based on tamma is called banya by the Lord Buddha. In other words, wisdom means carefully examining, contemplating, investigating the elements, tatu, the kantas and the changes of nature, sapawa, both externally and internally that are going on all the time everywhere. For when one has the mindfulness and wisdom needed to fix one's attention anywhere, the whole of it will be tamma. All these factors are like grindstones for sharpening wisdom continually. In every position and posture one will see these natural things, sapawa, displaying their characteristics, which are known by way of wisdom all the time. So tamma is to be found everywhere. It is not found just when you sit doing meditation or when you are walking jangama, for it is there at all times, so you need only make the effort to see it in all situations. The nature of wisdom practice is vast and very strange. 
To do what is truly appropriate, the teacher should explain to those who have a need to hear it only that particular aspect of wisdom they are dealing with at the time. This is the most suitable way to teach wisdom. Apart from that, he may explain enough to be a step or a pathway so that those who are beginning to train themselves in investigation may follow it, as in the explanation which has just been given. The jitta can be trained, but the characteristics of the jitta are things which can go on altering and changing step by step. From being gross, they can improve and become refined, depending on you who are the owner of them, and the way in which you direct them to go. Thus, for example, we have trained ourselves in the moral precepts, sila tamma, and we are at present training in meditation for samadhi, samadhi pawana, which is the training of the jitta which raises it up to a higher level. When we consider the processes of the jitta, then thinking of everything from the point of view of reason and morality is a way to make us act so that we rise higher. But there will also be things within ourselves which we will have to get rid of. In other words, there are both those things that we see to be bad which we should get rid of, and those things that we see to be right which we should practice and develop more and more. This may be called the practice or the training of the jitta for the purpose of attaining the level of understanding where causes and results steadily go higher. Conversely, if the jitta deteriorates, knowledge and understanding change and become steadily lower and lower. But if the jitta reaches complete purity, neither deterioration nor development take place, because the conditions that bring about deterioration and development have then disappeared from the heart. There remains only complete purity, the heart is tamma, and tamma is the heart. The heart and tamma are one and the same. From then on, no more changing and altering occurs. You have come to the end of the practice of brahmacharya for attaining the highest levels of tamma, and have completed the task of getting rid of all the gilesas. When you have finished the task of getting rid of the gilesas by fully developing tamma, what else is there to get rid of? There is nothing else there, because everything has been got rid of already and there is nothing more you can do to develop higher than this, because you have reached the highest already. As for deterioration, there is no basis for this to happen because you have reached akupa tamma, unshakable tamma, so there is no way for the jitta to deteriorate. The work which ought to be done, which is that of getting rid of and developing, has already been done to completion. This level of the jitta has nothing mundane, samudhi, entering and hiding in it, no time, no place, no past or future in relation to the present, such as, now it is like this, in the future what will it be like? This sort of time factor does not arise in the pure jitta. This life is like this, next life will be like that, does not occur in it, because the past and future have come together to exist in the present, having become pure, parisutte, in the heart. Past and future, which used to be associated with the heart, thus have no meaning at all, because the heart is devoid of the kind of meaning that would lead it into all sorts of delusions. If we call this the ultimate jitta, and the ultimate limit of the path along which the jitta goes, it would not be wrong. Everything that I have said here comes directly from the principles of practice, which are the results that come from the practice of the tamma. These principles follow the religion of the Buddha, which is the right path to follow, and one in which all Buddhists can be confident. There is no reason to doubt that the Tamma of the Lord Buddha has anything in it which might cause the world to be disrupted. Following the Tamma cannot lead us to disappointment or to loss of faith. Where in all the 84,000 Tammakanthas could we find cause for this? Nowhere! Therefore, there are no problems for those who practice Tamma properly. The only question that remains is, how do we practice so as to progress in accordance with the principles of the Tamma of the Lord Buddha? Tamma is called the Svakata Tamma, rightly taught Tamma. It is also Niyanika Tamma, because it steadily leads those who practice rightly to freedom from obstacles that obstruct the heart, until finally they penetrate through and reach Vimutti, or ultimate freedom. Then there is nothing left remaining in the heart. This is the ultimate and final result that comes from the practice of the Tamma of Buddhism. When one has reached this level, the heart and the religion are one and the same. The sasana and the heart cannot then find fault with each other. The heart is then genuine. The sasana is also genuine, each being respectively true. 
when the Lord Buddha said, Whoever sees the Tamma sees the Tathagata. He meant this Tamma. The Tathagata, in this case, is not the bodily form of the Buddha. The Buddha's bodily form is one aspect of the Tathagata. It refers to the bodily form of the Lord Buddha, which is of the same nature as our own bodies. In other words, someone who had seen the Lord Buddha and had saluted, paid homage, and done Buddha to the Lord could say that he had seen the Tathagata with his eyes. This is considered to be seeing one kind of Tathagata. Another way of seeing the Tathagata is when someone recollects the Lord Buddha, the Tamma, and the Sangha with faith and belief until he reaches Tamma, in which case he has also reached the Lord Buddha. Yet another way is when someone attains, stage by stage, the levels of Sodapanna, Sakadagami, or Anagami. This may be called seeing the Tathagata step by step until the final stage is reached. The true Tathagata is purity of Tamma and purity of heart, meaning that Tamma and the heart are one and the same, so that no way can be found to separate them. Wherever the heart is, there the Tamma is, and wherever the Tamma is, there the Tathagata is. Then it can be rightly said that whoever sees the Tamma sees the Tathagata. Seeing in the way of practice is like this. In other words, experiencing Tamma at the level of purity of heart following the example of the Lord Buddha is called seeing Tamma or seeing the Tathagata consummately. Then one has no doubts whether the Parinibbana of the Lord Buddha was 2,500 plus years ago or many aeons ago, because all this is a matter of relative convention, Sammati, which is the same as the conventions of the world everywhere. Thus the texts have recorded the places where the Lord was at different times to act as signposts indicating the times and locations of the Lord's activities for the benefit of faithful Buddhists who wish to pay homage to the Lord by doing Buddha on anniversaries of certain auspicious occasions. But as far as the complete purity of heart of the true Tathagata is concerned, there is no time and place associated with it at all. For the Arahant whose heart is entirely pure, wherever he may be, it is the same as if he were in the presence of the Lord Buddha, the Tamma, and the Sangha, all the time, a Galigo, eternally. Therefore, please practice these Buddhist teachings so that they develop in your hearts. Then you will not be without the Lord as your teacher wherever you go. This is similar to being in the presence of the Buddha, the Tamma, and the Sangha at all times until you reach Limutti, freedom within your Jitta then you will know for sure who the master really is without having any doubts. This explanation of Tamma is, I think, sufficient, so I will end here. Questions and Answers Adzan Mahabua When you try to remember what you are hearing while listening to an explanation of Tamma, the Jitta will not gain real value from listening. If you want the jitta to get value from listening to tamma, then let the jitta follow along with the discourse while contemplating it at the same time. In that way, in that way, you should be able to rid yourself of some of the gelesas while listening. Which gelesas they are will depend on what happens during the talk, but by practicing in this way, you may not be able to remember what the teacher talked about. When listening to a tamma talk in the manner of those who practice, one is usually less interested in remembering what is said and more interested in looking at the jitta and the tamma that the teacher is explaining at that time in order to get value from listening. For instance, the jitta may gain calm or wisdom may arise and get rid of certain kinds of gilesas. First question, woman one. The Lord Buddha was very subtle and when he used words they had definite meaning. Why then did he talk sometimes of jitta and sometimes of mano? Answer. Jitta and Mano, together with Vinyarna, are synonymous with each other, so they can be used in place of each other. Why do we have several words derived from the one word eat, as in eat, eating, eaten? The words Jitta and Mano are like this. They are used as required to suit the occasion. Second question, woman two. The Jitta is not Vinyarna Kanta, so surely it is not the same as any Vinyarna. Answer. Mano vinyarna equals Bhattisanti vinyarna, which goes to birth in various realms of existence, Tava. The teaching of the Lord Buddha is said to be composed of 84,000 Tamma Kantas, 
which are only a fraction of the whole teaching, since the Lord Buddha actually summarized the teaching to make it suitable to the capacity of beings in the world. As people do meditation, knowledge branches out more and more, so that when those who are practicing speak together, they can gain a lot more knowledge from each other. But for those who have yet to gain results from practice, however it is explained, it is not likely to be of much use. The Lord Buddha had experienced more tamma than his disciples, so when the Sāvakas approached him to ask about knowledge, saying that they had come across this experience or that experience, the Lord knew all about it already and could answer immediately. Although the experiences that happen to each person are different, someone who has already had such experiences will understand and can therefore guide them on the way along which he has already gone. Third question, Woman 3. Tana is not wanted for developing wisdom. Banya. How is this? Answer. Concerning Tana, if you don't have character tendencies suitable for it, there is no need to try to attain it. Only if Tana arises naturally should you use it. Someone who is not circumspect will aim to attain Tana much more than the path, Magga, Fruition, Pala, and Nibbana. In fact, Tana is a small matter compared with Sila, Smati, and Banya, which are the tools to cure all the Gilesas. This is like our own native language, which we all know, even though we never formally learnt it, nor took exams in it, nor gained any degrees in it. We do not need any degrees to communicate with each other, because just knowing our native language is enough for us to speak with each other. Tana means to concentrate intently. For instance, if you repeat butto, butto, butto with intense concentration, you can attain Tana. Tana is a natural principle, but it is not essential for developing wisdom, though it may be an aid. When contemplating form, ropa, vitakka is used, which is a factor of tāna. If this contemplation is done in a natural way, you who practice can experience tāna if your temperament is suited to it, though it may not go in the way that it is usually explained. Tāna interests us Buddhists a great deal, even though we have hardly experienced any genuine results of tāna, but we tend to talk extravagantly enough about it to be annoying. Fourth question, Woman 4. Please tell me how to develop calm, samatha. Answer. The training to make the jitta quiet is samatha, or calm. Contemplation and analysis that branches out step by step, giving rise to understanding, is wisdom. Fifth question, Woman 2. Samadhi and vipassana are two different ways to meditate, are they not? Some people say that we should practice the way of samatha, others that we must practice the way of vipassana. But can we alternate between the two? Answer. When you desire calm, you practice samatha. When you contemplate with wisdom so as to arouse methods of analysis by examining both externally and internally, it is called vipassana. Sixth question, woman two. I feel that it is more difficult to develop wisdom, anya, than calm, samatha. Answer. When you do samadhi, you aim for calm. When you do vipassana, you aim for seeing truly with wisdom. You should do them at different times, and you should not mix them together. There are many kinds of work done in the world, some easy, some difficult. It is necessary for some people to do work that is difficult. If those people are afraid of difficulties, they will not be able to accomplish anything. So when the time comes to work, you should truly work hard and persevere at it until you see the fruit of that work. If you do this, you will have the means to accomplish the correct results both in samadhi and vipassana. It is not beyond one's ability. Seventh question, woman two. How can we develop our outlook so as to make us not afraid of difficulties? Answer. By the training to develop wisdom. When should you do it? You may do it any time, anywhere. Train yourself to think, to consider carefully, to meditate, to use your head. Analyze the elements, pātu, and kantas from the outside going inward. Analyze those elements and kantas that are inside of you, bringing them up for comparison with external things until you see with wisdom that they both have the same characteristics. If you have already entered the level of vipassana, you will know for yourself extensively, and this will go on increasing. If you are simply afraid of difficulties, you will meet nothing but the difficulties that are there in your heart. Then they will always be an obstacle to your work, so that you never have an opportunity to do that work. 
This fear of difficulties is a very important geleza indeed. Trying hard with persistence to oppose difficulty and hardship is the path, magga. It is the tool for curing every kind of geleza, so you should take interest in it. Eighth question, woman two. In two or three days' time, I will enter a training course for teachers in order to learn how to teach religion to children. How can I help children to have a broad understanding of religion? Answer. There is no obstacle in teaching others that is greater than the obstacle of teaching yourself. Let us understand that before teaching others. In teaching religion, you are only able to teach others to the extent that you yourself understand the religion. To understand religion by way of the texts is easy, but to understand it truly with your heart is difficult, both for yourself and for others. Therefore, it is truly very important to practice the religion first in order to understand it. Ninth question, woman five. When one has determined to listen to a talk but cannot remember it afterwards, would you say something about this? Answer. When you can remember what was said, what value do you get from it? One may answer that one gets the instructions on how to practice, but truly speaking, nothing is lost in being unable to remember. Furthermore, it can bring you valuable results in a different way, for the heart gains calm at the time of listening because there is no anxiety about remembering. You will be able to remember the tamma retained within the heart, meaning that what was heard and understood made a deep impression and resulted in happiness of heart while you were listening. It is comparable to a child eating food. The child need not know from where the food comes or how it was processed. While he is eating, he gets the satisfying taste of it. He takes the food which provides nourishment for his body, keeping it fit and well, and that is sufficient. There is no need to memorize everything while listening, but you should calm the heart and keep it focused inside. Do not send it outside at that time. The jitta will receive knowledge by continually following the tamma which is being explained. Then the results of calm and peace will arise, or various ways and means will come to mind as you listen. This is what is meant by making gains from listening in the way of practice. Tenth question, woman five. You say nothing is lost if we don't remember. This gives me a lot of hope. Answer. Taking notes and remembering names and words while listening is of no value at all. All you get then is the names of Tamma and of the Gilesas. But the Gilesas diminish neither in strength nor in numbers. When you listen without remembering, but at the same time you follow the discourse with understanding, you will probably succeed in getting rid of Gilesas as you listen. So even though you cannot remember what was said, you will get successful results in the way of practice. While listening with mindfulness firmly established within your heart and not sending it out externally, not even to the person who is explaining at that moment, the knowing inside is limited to yourself. Because of that, you are likely to be able to understand the tamma that is being explained better than if you were to send your awareness out to receive it. Good results will then appear steadily in the heart. They will be able to reduce and get rid of gilesas bit by bit every time that you listen, until you are able to go beyond them, as happened in the time of the Buddha, when many attained both Magga and Pala while listening to the Buddha. Therefore, listening to Tamma is an aspect of practice that is much more important than doing the practice on your own, and those who practice have been very interested in it ever since those days. <laughs>